Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion, and I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and to tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. Following me and sharing me on social media are very important because I'm a one-man shop, no money for advertising, so social media is the way that I grow. So please do follow me on Twitter at SYLTales and every other social media known to man. There's a list of them on my About page for this channel. I would appreciate yours for it via a page on my website, SYLRanch.tv, and there's a link to that in my description box. Well, today we get to do the long-form review. First time I've done one of these since I started doing um, anything other than just in my live streams, but it's my first long-form review, so you're going to get the full totality of everything that I have to say about this film. The 40th anniversary review of Hangar 18. Now, to explain my show for some people who may be new to me, especially since this is a long-form review, my show, Tales from S.Y.L. Ranch, is a science fiction, fantasy, horror, superhero, and other genre-related review show. Sometimes I review serious films and TV. Sometimes I review schluck. Today could be one of those. And sometimes I review modern films or TV shows with a broad appeal, such as Star Wars movies, Marvel movies, The Orville, Doctor Who, and lately, Batwoman, the modern Plan 9 from Outer Space. I no longer, however, review or even watch Star Trek or any Star Trek property because Star Trek is no longer Star Trek. I have talked about this in my video of the same name, and there is a link to that in my description box below. For classic films and TV, I usually stick to a period of about 1900 and 1980. And that's because the period after 1980 is pretty well documented. We kind of think of it as a modern era of science fiction. However, 1900 to 1980 contains a lot of science fiction and a lot of science fiction fandom that isn't documented. So part of the reason I do the show is to document that. I go into a lot more depth than any other reviewer. I don't just say if I like the film or not. I don't just walk through the plot and say, oh, this was good, that was good, that was bad. I go into the acting, the direction, the cinematography, and all the mechanics of making a film. And I can do this because a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor. Uh, so I could speak with a uh, modicum of authority. Not as much as a modern working actor, but with some authority. There is an old saying, those who can do and those who can't teach. And I suppose that maybe doing reviews is a little bit like teaching. One thing I do not do is outrage reviews. There are a lot of reviewers on YouTube who are simply actors portraying outrage because they realized after The Last Jedi that outrage tends to sell. They hate everything with a knee-jerk reflex because they know that their viewers want to see them hate things. And this causes a very strange feedback loop between fans and popular reviewers where eventually, ultimately, nobody likes anything, even if it happens to be good. But I don't do that. If I like something, I'll say why. If I don't, I will say why in detail. But I do not do outrage. Unlike other reviewers, I am the adult in this room. As a non-spoiler review for Hangar 18, oh man, oh man. Well, huh, I guess I can say that it is a generally, at best, mediocre film. This comes two years after Star Wars. The bar was being set fairly high at this point for science fiction. Um, you know, to come out with something like this that is a really, really low budget, um, it rips off so many different things. It rips off elements from the much better 1978 film, Capricorn One. It adds elements of the U.S.'s then new space shuttle program, uh, things about, you know, the landing of aliens, general paranoia about the now famous Area 51, Hangar 18. It's low budget. It's shot on a, you know, comparatively by that time. I don't know what the budget was. I couldn't find out. But comparatively at that time, relatively small budget. Um, made a good profit for what was spent on it. Everything in it is, you know, made just like a low budget film. For a low budget film, they were getting the best they could, I think. So would I recommend the thing? Yes, but I would not pay for it. <laughs> I would watch uh, basically one of several copies that are on YouTube, probably in violation of copyright, um, and do it before somebody reports them for the copyright violation. Now, there is one channel, the Movie Central channel. They appear to have some rights to put this stuff up. 
Um, they have a good 720p copy. Link to it in my description box if you're interested in seeing it, if you haven't already. So we will have to take it as read that if you've come to this video looking for a review you've already watched, Hangar 18, or you just don't care if it's spoiled for you. But nevertheless, for safety's sake, we should issue ourselves a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a Fandai master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. But this is neither a boast nor a brag. This is where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. The problem with Fandai masters is that we are cursed. You just can't see the new stuff without seeing the century that came before. You find out that there isn't that much that's original, and it sometimes interferes with your ability to enjoy things, and it certainly did with this film. <laughs> Aside from being low budget, absolutely nothing, nothing happens in this film that I didn't find 100% completely predictable, and I probably would have at the time as a Padawan. But, as a story... Getting into the story itself. I'll run through the plot as quick as I can. The film opens with a card, a title card, stating that the events of this film are based on real events and it was only due to recently to brave people who've come forward to give you the right to send new information. No, oh, that's crap. That's no more real than Plan 9 from Outer Space's intro was. No. This is based on pure fiction. It's not based on a damned thing. It's based on, if anything, it's just based on pulling in all these other aspects from other movies and putting them together. It's not based on reality. So in the film, a satellite just launched from the space shuttle collides with an unidentified object, which, after being spotted on radar moving at great speeds, had positioned itself just over the shuttle. The collision kills an astronaut in the launch bay. The events are witnessed by Bancroft and Price, the astronauts on board the shuttle. After returning to Earth, the two are immediately stymied when they try to discuss what happened. They are told by Harry Forbes, the deputy director of NASA, that, quote, and he says this repeatedly, everything is going to be all right. After making a controlled landing in the Arizona desert, the damaged spacecraft, this is the alien one, has been recovered, taken to an Air Force base in Texas, and installed inside Hangar 18, as opposed to Area 51, where scientists and other technicians Harry, headed by Harry Forbes, the direct, deputy director of NASA, where they can study it. Now, due to an impending presidential election within like a week or two, something like that, government officials are anxious that there be no chance of, the, of this getting into the press or the public even getting an inkling of this. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to Harry Forbes, the Air Force then puts out a news story blaming Bancroft and Price for the death of their colleague and for the destruction of the satellite. Now, the men, of course, know that they can prove otherwise by viewing the telemetry tapes which recorded the UFO. But when they see them, all evidence of the object has been erased. Though, through a friend who works at a remote tracking station, Bancroft and Price are able to see the real tele telemetry and discover where the alien craft landed. And they set out to prove a cover-up and to clear their names. Back in the hangar, investigators who enter the ship find it to have been manned by a crew of two, now both dead. And fortunately enough, during the collision with the satellite, some chemicals were released that produced a short-lived toxic gas, so everybody's fine. As technicians and scientists work, they discover several things. One is a woman in some sort of stasis who later wakes up in an ambulance screaming. And there's absolutely no further mention of this woman or anything related to her ever again. Wakes up screaming, that's it, we're done. <laughs> they find symbols on the control panels that match those used by Earth's ancient civilizations, although I don't think that's necessarily true in real life. The ship's computer re reveals extensive surveillance footage of power plants, military bases, industrial plants, and major cities worldwide. And upon autopsy, the aliens' physiology shows that they, they and humans underwent a similar evolutionary process. One of the scientists deduces that the ship could not have reached Earth on its own, that it must have been launched from a larger, faster, and more long-range mothership. Back with the astronauts in their dogged pursuit of the truth, Bancroft and Price get closer to, ha to Hangar 18, but they're repeatedly targets of government agents. They elude one team of agents who are killed during a high-speed chase. Later, as they're driving, they realize their rental car... <laughs> has no brakes, so after careening along the roads, they come to rest 
on the grounds of a gas refinery. The agents begin shooting at them, so they drive off. What else would they drive off in? An oil tanker. <laughs> With the agents following them, Price, he climbs out onto the tanker, lets some gas out of the truck, lights an emergency flare, and tosses the flare. This kills the pursuers, but Price is fatally shot in the process and dies shortly afterwards. Meanwhile, when Harry Forbes learns of Price's death, he demands that the Air Force produce Bancroft at Hangar 18, or he will go to the press with the truth. Their cover-up and the careers now threatened, government officials decide to fl remotely fly a plane filled with explosives into Hangar 18, thereby finally assuring secrecy. The researchers, however, have determined that the aliens have been to Earth before and that their human beings are, in fact, their descendants. Further examination of the video footage reveals that the industrial and military sites are designated landing areas, suggesting that the aliens are preparing to return in the near future. Bancroft then arrives at the base and, after being chased for a while, comes across Harry Forbes, who shows him the alien craft. And just as it is revealed that a translation indicates that the aliens are about to return, the plane crashes into Hangar 18 in a massive explosion. And over the ruins and wreckage and fire of this, we hear a news report about the explosion that says some technicians survived because, as NASA has stated, they were shielded inside the alien spacecraft. Harry Forbes has then a scheduled a press conference for that afternoon. And scene. Okay, so I usually try to come up with some great moments. I would have to say the great moments here, if we have any, are things like the car chases, um, you know, the explosions, you know, stuff like that. They were spending a lot of money, most of the budget. Budget went really to two places on this film. Uh, effects like the car explosions and car chases and kind of second unit work and also into um, the uh, actor salaries because we got a lot of actors here who were either well-known at the time or uh, 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 were well-known faces, um, character actors whose names you might not know but you'd seen quite a lot at that time. So it went into the talent and it went into the um, explosions. Those are really the only really great moments you can say about this film. It, it's otherwise, you know, a knockoff of a number of different things. Cringe moments. Well, the basic premise about the astronauts is just plain stupid. All that you would have to do, they're United States Air Force personnel. All that you'd have to do is tell them to keep their mouths shut, and they would have. Now, if you were also sort of a cringe moment from that era, the character of White House Chief of Staff Gordon Kane, played by Robert Vaughn, whom I'll talk about later, is straight out of President Nixon's hatchet man, G. Gordon Liddy. And then one of the funniest, you know, so bad it's good kind of moments <laughs> is this one. Oops. Sorry. Uh, the, so, one of the so bad it's good moments is this one. There is a funny moment. When Darren McGavin's character says, Bill's right, we've got to find out how this thing ticks, what makes, this thi what makes things tick. And then with regard to any at all, with the people who are around him as researchers and whatnot, he presses a couple of random buttons that cause an energy beam, actually it's a series of four beams in parallel, shoot out, fry a computer as you can see here, narrowly missing, you know, two, immediately two people right on the side, another two or three over here, and frankly almost anybody around, <laughs> just no regard to anybody out there. Just starts punching buttons. Uh, the beam is then later shown to have gone clean through the opposite wall and out of the hangar, and who knows how far beyond it what might have hit out there. So <laughs> it's just dumb. As I say, it's kind of a cringe moment, but it's also so funny it's rather good. There are a couple of moments like that, but that one stands out head and shoulders. Just so funny, you know. Um, then there's the uh, space shuttle themselves. Um, now, of course, in, in real life, um, and again, it's not quite a cringe moment, but the first space shuttle wouldn't actually go to space until a year later in 1981. And the space shots are of models, not surprisingly. The shots of a real shuttle were from the test flights of the Enterprise, OV-101. Now, that one never went to space. Uh, it was used purely as a test vehicle. But you can see when it rolled out here, um, and you can see that the uh, cast and crew, um, mostly the crew of Star, or cast rather of Star Trek, the original series, was invited because the reason that that shuttle was named Enterprise was because of fans. In the late 1960s, or in the last two seasons of Star Trek, the original series, it had been a series of fan mail-in campaigns 
to NBC that kept the show alive. And so we made a lot of mail-in campaigns. And when we heard about the first space shuttle being named the Constitution, that's what it was going to be. Constitution with the first, second one to roll out would have been Enterprise, and that one would have gone to orbit. Um, but we all said to ourselves, oh, no, the first one should be the Enterprise. And so we had a mail-in campaign. Sadly, of course, it didn't go to space. But because of that, the cast of Star Trek, the original series, as you can see here, uh, with uh, Nimoy in the center and uh, Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry right over there. So they all got to come to this. Now, I was talking about the writer first, because without a script, you ain't got nothing to shoot. So the good or blame for anything dramatic, whether it's good or bad, lies with the writer. In this case, the blame rests with ultimately five people. One was Ken Pettis, who wrote the screenplay. Then there was Thomas C. Chapman, who's credited with the story. James L. Conway, the director, also credited with part of the story. And then there are two other uncredited writers, Stephen Lord and James O'Malley. Now, having so many fingers on a script is usually a really bad thing. This probably accounts for some of the film's general mediocrity and how it's just taking other aspects of other movies and shoving them together. One kind of has to assume that to some extent, you know, I'm sure the producer had a lot to do with this, because again, when I get into the producer, you will find that he has a lot of this type of material under his belt. But the story was in part by the director, um, James Conway. I think maybe he had something to do with it. But again, it's very much it's very much like what the producer tended to do. It's the producer's style of movie. But we'll never really know, you know, how much of it was contributed by the screenwriter versus anybody else. It's really anybody's guess. If you really want to pay me to write the definitive work on this film and why anyone would do that, would care enough to bother, you know, I can't imagine. But feel free to write me a check if you want me to. Um, but until then, we're just going to have to make some educated guesses. So without knowing who contributed what nor how much, it's really impossible to lay the blame for the script on any one person. However, it is mediocre. The plot about astronauts trying to clear their names while being pursued by their own government is lifted straight out of Capricorn 1, a much better film, right down to the only one act astronaut who survives. UFOs were a big craze in the 1970s, bigger than you can even imagine right now. And this would have been the last, one of the last ditch attempts to exploit the UFO craze uh, with this movie. The idea of government uh, covering up UFOs and extraterrestrials, well, that was something that began in earnest with the famous Roswell incident of 1947, and that sort of thing continues right up to the present day. At least that we can, you know, kind of still appreciate. Though, again, if they really wanted to solve the whole problem, they just did, would have told these two United States Air Force officers, don't talk about this. And I can't imagine that they would have said, no, I've got to talk about the aliens. They would have said, yes, sir, I won't talk about anything. You got it. The idea that humans had either been descended from aliens, originated on another planet, or were influenced by aliens at some point in history had been in literary science fiction for decades. It had been in film since at least 1968, when it was a central plot point for 2001, A Space Odyssey. So there's nothing new here. This is just a hodgepodge of other ideas strung together. The best you can say about this script is it has a four-act structure. You can generally follow the action, although there are plot threads like the human woman in stasis that are never resolved. And it has a reasonably satisfying ending. However, there was a different ending that was screened to test audiences. And that one was different from, when, from the released one, only that there was no voiceover at the end over this flaming pile of debris except for the spacecraft that's intact. The you know implication was that there had been no survivors from the explosion, and you know that would be that. It was didn't test well at all. That te ending tested really badly, so they added the voiceover. It's otherwise an identical film. Take off the voiceover, and it ends on a much darker note. And that just didn't test well with the audience, so they put the voiceover in. The film has a decent-sized cast with a number of very recognizable faces. Uh, however, I'm really only going to talk about a few that are really the most important to the plot. So for first off, we get Gary Collins as astronaut uh, Steve Bancroft. Now, Gary Collins was with us from 1938 to 2012 when he died at the age of 74. 
His IMDb shows him active from 1962 to 2009, so darn near up to when he passed away. At the time of this film's being shot, he was actually a very recognizable sort of leading man act character actor. If you knew his face, even if you didn't know his name, you knew his face. He was around a lot. He had 70 acting credits. He did three episodes of the 70s TV series Fantasy Island. He did two episodes of Charlie's Angels from the 70s. He did one episode of Bionic Woman, one episode of The Six Million Dollar Man as different characters. He played the lead in all 24 episodes of The Sixth Sense, as well as, preceding that, three episodes of The Night Gallery, in which he played the same character, kind of, you know, backdoor pilot into the series. And he did 29 episodes of The Wackiest Ship in the Army, which was a sitcom. He won. He got six Daytime Emmy nominations. He won one Photoplay Award nomination. And he got his star on the Walk of Fame for television in 1985. His performance here is fine. <laughs> they paid money to get him. He, he was a well-known actor at this time. You know, he, he, he'd been around a lot. He'd done a lot of stuff, would right up until his death almost. Um, so they paid money to get him. And, and he does well with the material that he's given. It's just that the material he's given isn't that good, and it's derivative of so much other material that he's just like, uh, just, okay. Uh, so he does a good job with the performance. He does a good performance. You know, I, I always think of it as a good mark of a great actor if you can make stupid, clunky dialogue work. And he can make it work. He's a good enough actor. He's a good enough actor. He could make almost anything work, which is why he was, you know, employed so much. But he makes it work, but he's just, there's not a lot here. There's not much here. It's a dumb plot. We can, as with often is the case with actors of this era and maybe a decade or two before, we can play Six Degrees of Star Trek. He was in an episode of Police Woman. Angie Dickinson, the beautiful Angie Dickinson, starred in Police Woman. And Angie Dixon, Dickinson was also one of the stars of a movie called a Big Bad Mama. You've never heard of this? I'm not surprised. But William Shatner was also in Big Bad Mama. Now, uh, he also has, uh, Gary Collins, another Six Degrees of Star Trek, because Angie Dickinson also starred in a film, a oh, crappy exploitation film, called Pretty Maids All in a Row. And this was 1970. It was produced by Gene Roddenberry. It was Gene Roddenberry's only motion picture credit other than the first Star Trek movie, in terms of what he produced. There's also a Six Degrees of Star Trek that is shared by everyone in this film due to the appearance uh, in it of William Shallert. Won't be talking about this Six Degrees of Star Trek except, you know, where it's the only one that some of these people have. Because a lot of them have more than one. But William Shallert was in a, this film for, like, a scene. In Star Trek, the original series episode, The Trouble with Tribbles, he played uh, Commissioner Neil, uh, Nils Barris. And in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, he played v Valani Valanis rather, in the episode Sanctuary. Uh, so again, this connection is something that obviously anybody in this movie shares. Uh, anytime you do a Six Degrees of Star Trek with any of these actors, you can go straight to him. But I won't talk about him except for he's the only one. We also have, oh, the immortal Robert Vaughn as the uh, White House Chief of Staff, Gordon Kane. Uh, he was with us from 1932 to 2016, just a few years ago. His IMDb well, shows him active from 1955 to 2017 with 229 acting credits. That I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look up, and I didn't. But that is either a show record for the number of acting credits or very damned close to one. One of those is posthumous. He is most famous in science fiction, fandom, etc., for playing the character Napoleon Solo in The Man from Uncle, the 1964 TV series. Now, if you don't know who Robert Vaughn was, then you have simply missed out on roughly 65 years of TV and film. He was everywhere for a very long, long time. He also had two director credits. He won a Primetime Emmy in 1978 for outstanding continuing performance by a supporting actor in a drama series for Washington, Behind Closed Doors. He won the Photoplay Awards in 1966 for Most Popular Male Star, got his walk of star on the Walk of Fame in 1998 for Motion Pictures, and has eight other, other nominations, including one Oscar nomination. His performance here is fine. 
you know, he's taking a character that is really very, very similar to G. Gordon Liddy of the Nixon era. And anybody watching this, you know, with the first name Gordon, they would have instantly put together, oh, G. Gordon Liddy, you know, that's what they would have thought. Um, but he, he does what he usually does here, which is, a, you know, his usual good performance. Again, one of those actors that can take crappy, clunky dialogue and stupid script and still somehow make the character work. He's sleazy. Um, he's a sleazy politician. There's just no wishing about it. But he does a good job with it. I, I, you can't fault his performance in this kind of crappy material. We can, of course, with him play Six Degrees of Star Trek. He has several, but the most uh, direct is playing the recurring character of Captain, Captain Raymond Br Rambridge in the one-season TV show The Lieutenant from 1964, which was created and often written by Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek. Then we have James Hampton as astronaut Lou Price. James Hampton uh, was born in 1936. He is still with us. His IMDb shows him active from 1962 to 2015, so just a few years ago. He had another guy who was working, 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 93 actor credits. He was an extremely recognizable character actor. In this period of time, especially in the 70s, 80s, if you, if you didn't know his name, you knew his face. You seen him everywhere. He was working, working, working. Uh, some of the bigger, bigger things he did in terms of in genre stuff, he was in Teen Wolf, both in the film and the animated series where he vo voiced the same character. He was in the 1988 Superboy TV series, did an episode of that, did an episode of Tales of the Golden Monkey. And no, Tales from S S.Y.O. Ranch does not get its name from that. Tales of the Golden Monkey was a 1983 sort of Indiana Jones knockoff TV series. It's interesting to watch just because of its place in history. Somebody said, oh, oh, we got to we got to knock off. We got to rip off Indiana Jones. What can we do? What can we do? And they came up with Tales of the Golden Monkey. It's not horrible. It's just not very good. <laughs> but uh, Hampton also has 14 director credits, five writer credits, two soundtrack credits, and one producer credits. He has won no awards. His performance here. Now, it's interesting because he tended to get roles that were guys that were maybe a little dumber. Or guys that maybe had, uh, you know, were coaches, things like that. Not usually the real intelligent roles, generally speaking. Um, he had, uh, I think probably with this one, this is probably, he's playing an Air Force officer, an astronaut, clearly. Smart dude. Um, so I think he's probably thinking to himself, hey, this is nice. I get to change a pace where I get to do something and, and you know, die heroically, which is nice. And he does a good job with it. It's nice to see that he has that range because, again, a lot of the times he was doing other types of roles as a character actor. So good performance here. Crappy material, but he does the best he can with it. Again, one of the good signs of marks of a great actor is the ability to take crappy, crappy material and somehow make it work, and he does. We can, of course, with him play Six Degrees of Star Trek because he was in an episode of Tales of the Golden Monkey. And Tales of the Golden Monkey starred Stephen Collins. And Stephen Collins was a Commander Will Decker in Star Trek The Motion Picture. And then, the immortal, inestimable, kind of everywhere, somehow, in this kind of genre stuff, Darren McGavin as NASA uh, Deputy Director Harry Forbes. He was with us from 1922 to 2006, died at the age of 83. His IMDb shows him as active 1945 to 2008, with a large gap between 1999 and 2008. He's getting older, but somehow, 2008, he had some kind of posthumous role. Another guy who was working, 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 working. He has 184 actor credits, with numerous recurring and leading roles on numerous TV series. In genre and often outside, he is iconic for the character of Carl Kolchak from the Kolchak TV movies and the TV series Kolchak the Night Stalker. This series was very significant because it was a direct inspiration for the X-Files and the producers and writers of that have said so outright. It's basically also kind of a inspiration for almost any other kind of vampire, alien, horror, kind of hunter series that ever came along afterwards. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I'm looking at you at least partly. 
You can see a couple of the things that he did in that, The Night Stalker, which is a 1972 TV movie. There is a link to that in my description box, as well as the sequel to The Night Stalker, The Night Strangler in 1973, another TV movie. And again, there's a link to that in my description box. You can find a majority of the episodes of Kolchak, The Night Stalker, the TV series, on YouTube, um, probably in violation of copyright, so grab them and watch them while you can. As always, the buzzword is search and you shall find. Darren McGavin won the Cable Ace Awards in 1992 for Best Actor in a Dramatic Series for the General Motors Playwrights Theater. He also won the Western Heritage Award in 1962, a Bronze Wrangler for uh, Best Drama for Rawhide, and he has one Primetime Emmy, Emmy nomination. His performance here, okay. Somehow, Darren McGavin tends to be playing Darren McGavin. I, I don't know how this works, because he somehow still makes it work. His performance tends to be very similar from role to role. He gets emotions right where they're supposed to be right, and but it, but you, you, you cannot miss that it's Darren McGavin. You will never, ever think that he's somebody other than Darren McGavin. Good actor, working all the time, clearly. And, uh, you know, particularly the, the, the Night Stalker. That is, that is a really good role for him. Best one he probably did in his entire life. But very, very good. Again, Hallmark of it, a good actor, can take some dumb material and make it work. Like when he says, well, we've got to figure out what makes things tick and just clicks a couple of buttons and, you know, causes a giant accident. Um, you know, a lesser actor, that might not have worked. It's funny here because of what he does. But he makes that moment work. It's just that you're going, oh, my God, how stupid are you? But he, it still works for him. He, you know, so he does a good performance. Uh, you know, can't, can't fault him with anything that he does here. We can also, of course, play with him. Six Degrees of Star Trek. He was in an episode of Mission Impossible in the 1960s, early 1970s. And after Star Trek was canceled, Leonard Nimoy played the regular character of Paris in that Mission Impossible series. So... The production. The producer on this is Charles E. Sellier, or Sellier, I'm not sure which. I'll just say Sellier, Jr. Um, he was with us 1943 to 2011, died at the age of 67, sadly. His IMDb shows him active from very early in the 1950s all the way up to 2008, with 69 producer credits. Probably he was most famous for producing the Grizzly Adams series of TV movies and then the TV series um, The Lifetime of Grizzly Adams. Now, he did a lot of conspiracy, alien projects, and stuff like that that were essentially trying to, you know, exploit the fact that there was something going on in pop culture at the time, like this one. He was doing a couple of different three pop culture things that he threw into the same movie at the same time. Because he was saying, oh, this is popular in pop culture, I'll make some money off of this. He did a lot of that. He did, for example, just moving sort of backwards in his career, Ancient Secrets of the Bible in 2007, rather. The Longevity Secret is Noah's Ark, the Key to Immortality, 2007. Encounters with the Unexplained, a 2000-2002 TV series. The UFO Diaries, a 1995 TV series. In Search of Noah's Ark and in search of historical Jesus. And again, thinking about all those things, anytime those were done, that was taking advantage, was exploiting something that was popular in pop culture. And that stuff that's that In Search Of, if you're familiar with the TV series In Search Of that starred Leonard Nimoy, those movies did not have Nimoy in them. I can't imagine that Nimoy would have touched those, touched those with a 10-meter cattle prod. Um, they were using those names because they were capitalizing on the fact that Nimoy had been in that series. They were thinking, oh, okay, people will hear this and they'll go, oh, okay, Nimoy's in this. We'll go to this. The, the Star Trek fans will show up. Nimoy was not in any of those. He was just doing exploitation. Uh, he also has 13 writer credits and four director credits. He's won, a, he's got a primetime Emmy, Emmy nomination, but no ones. In terms of the production on this, the, I could not find a budget figure for this, but it was obviously low. I mean, this was two years after Star Wars, when competent, big-budget science fiction, that was becoming the norm. You know, for something to look this cheap meant that they were spending as little as possible. 
Uh, most of the budget, again, probably went to actor salaries and the car chases and the explosions and stuff. Uh, the one thing we we're missing in this would be chicks in bikinis. Um, otherwise, just a pure exploitation on various things going on in pop culture. Let's get some explosions in there. You know, let's get some actors whose name people know, and it'll add weight to the film. Maybe they won't realize it's such a piece of junk. The profit on this thing was at that time $11 million at the box office. Doesn't sound like much, but if you turn it into modern 2020 movies, adjust for inflation, that's about 34532000 Not a giant, you know, runaway success, but look at the budget, right? You're looking at a relatively small budget, fairly large return on that investment. So, you know, made some money. <laughs> like it or not, this thing made money. The parts of the movie were filmed in Midland and Big Spring, Texas, and also at the former Pyote uh, Air Force Base, as well as the former Webb Air Force Base. And they did do also some shooting in Salt Lake City. The film cites at the end the grateful co for the cooperation of the United States Air Force. Uh, given, however, how the Air Force is treated in this film, it's really hard to imagine that they helped very much. You want to see something where the Air Force, you know, actively helped, watch Stargate SG-1. You know, that's a movie where the a, a TV series where the Air Force actually helped. And, and it, you know, it showed because the Air Force was treated very respectfully. Here, you know, as I say, the whole thing would have gone down totally different if they just said these two Air Force officer NASA, you know, um, astronauts don't talk about this. And they would have said... Yes, sir. You know, we'll not talk about it. Just dumb. Uh, Hangar 18 <laughs> it holds a distinction as being one of the very few American films to be th shown theatrically in the Soviet Union. I expect this is probably because the government is shown here as both corrupt and fairly incompetent. Um, we can play Six Degrees of Star Trek with him, but really the only thing that he's got is um, uh, William Shallard in this film, Star Trek... Uh, the original series in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. The director, on the other hand, this one's very interesting. The director is James L. Conway. Now, James uh, has uh, been with us a while. He was, his IMDb shows him active 1973 to present. I've actually talked about him before. He has 45 director credits. Now, his first gig was in search of Noah's Ark with, of course, the uh, producer Charles E. Sellier, which I assume that's where he met him. Um, he then did four episodes of The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams under, again, this producer, Charles E. Sellier. He did Seven Greatest Heroes of the Bible, Bible two, seven episodes of that. He wrote two of those, again, under the same producer, Charles E. Sellier, Jr. And then he did Hangar 18. That was actually his 10th credit, but his actual 19th actual directing gig. Because anytime you get into IMDb, one credit may be equal to 10 episodes of a TV series. So this was the case with him in those cases. He did, however, break out of kind of weird films after that. And most recently, he has done eight episodes of The Magicians, running 2016 to present. One episode of The Orville, which is where I've talked about him before. He did Aquarius, Supernatural, Smallville. The 16 episodes of, the, of Charmed, the 1990s, early 2000s series. Five episodes of Star Trek Enterprise. Seven episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Four episodes of Star Trek Voyager. Three episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. And has done seven episodes of MacGyver. The 1980s uh, version of that, 1990s. He also has 25 producer credits, which includes one of those as 121 episodes of Charmed. Again, the early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s series, and also 13 episodes of Titans, the 2000 TV series, not anything more recent. And he has 10 writer credits as well. He has won the Western Heritage Awards in 1989, the Bronze Wrangler for fictional television drama for Paradise, and has won Primetime Emmy nomination. His direction here is flat and boring. <laughs> now, having seen some of his later material, I do not blame him for this. The direction here is flat and boring because this was a low-budget television show. I mean, a movie. There's just no getting around it. It was low-budget. And when you have a low budget, that means you don't have much time. That means you don't have a lot of time to do creative and interesting things with your filmmaking. You've got to get the sh shots set up and done and out into the can. And hopefully with multiple takes. <laughs> so I don't blame him. 
you know, you, you do what you can under those circumstances. And also remember the equipment of that time, you know, a movie theater, movie camera would be this big and really heavy and you just couldn't do much with it. <clears throat> so if you're going to set up interesting shots, that's going to take a lot of time. Didn't have it. So I can't blame him for that. We can, of course, with him, very easily play uh, Six Degrees of Star Trek because he directed Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise episodes. Cinematographer on this, um, cinematographer here is uh, Paul Hipp. Now, he was with us from 1938 to 2006. His IMDb lists him active as 1963 to 1982 with 41 cinematographer credits and seven camera and electrical department credits, which usually means you're the guy who's actually running the camera. Yeah, and he has won no awards in cinematography. Now, always say my regular viewers will have heard it before. You'll hear it again. What the director's job is to do is to say, I want to get these shots. Here's the shots I want. Cinematographer's job is to say, absolutely, I can get you those shots. Sometimes, under the best of circumstances, you have a little collaboration back and forth between the director and the cinematographer, and one of them will have come up with some cool idea that's maybe a little better than what the other one had the, you know, thought of for doing the shot. Um, and so they'll canoodle and they'll say, yeah, okay, this could be done a little bit better if we just tweak this here and there. I have no idea if that was happening. Not a clue. With this kind of uh, low-budget film, you know what cinematography you can get is what you get. Everything's lit pretty bright and flat. Um, the, uh, you know, the only thing that's darker is the exterior of the alien ship. The interior, again, lit pretty light and flat. Um, the most you can say is that the bare minimum, you know, that you actually have to have with a cinematographer is you know what you're supposed to look at, you can see what you're supposed to see. All that was happening here, low budget, that's fine. <laughs> uh, music, we have a couple of people um, credited for this, um, one of which is uh, John uh, Kakavas, and the other is uncredited Bob Summers. Now, John Kakavas. Uh, he was with us from 1930 to 2014 and passed away at the age of 83. His IMDb shows him as active from 1958 to 2000 with 80 composer credits. Uh, he has done quite, he did quite a crap ton of sh uh, cop shows, mysteries. That seems to be what he was really known for. He also has 64 soundtrack credits, generally the writer of some very specific individual numbers or, uh, and some arranging of other people's stuff. He also has 17 music department credits, which are virtually all theme song music that he wrote for TV shows. And he won the ASCAP Film and Television Music Awards in 1986 for Most Performed Underscore. I have no idea where that was for. As always, with someone, we can play uh, Six Degrees of Star Trek because he scored seven episodes of Mrs. Columbo, and Mrs. Columbo starred Kate Mulgrew as Kate Columbo, the aforementioned Mrs. Columbo. Kate Mulgrew, of course, played Captain Janeway on Star Trek Voyager. The other guy who's not credited is Bob Summers. He was active 1967 to 2013 with, uh, sorry, I lost it here. Uh, sorry, he was active from, I can't get to where I'm seeing here. Sorry, going the wrong way. Uh, uh, 47 composer department uh, credits, 24 music department credits. <clears throat> uh, he did a lot of composer credits for English dubs of various incarnations of Sailor Moon, uh, any of those series. Very apparently well known for that. He has 13 soundtrack credits, including the Sailor Moon theme, and worked a lot with the producer James E. Sellier Jr. and won no awards. Uh, we can also with him, as always, play Six Degrees of Star Trek because he did some songs and music for something called The Last Man on Earth, question mark, uh, with Robert Beltran. And uh, that was a 13-minute short. No idea what it is. Never seen it. But, of course, Robert Beltran played Chakotay on Star Trek Voyager. The music here is forgettable. <laughs> it matches the action. It does what it's supposed to do. It adds tension in places and excitement in places where, you know, silence would otherwise have, you know, not been as effective. It does what it's supposed to do. But do you remember it? No. 
but then again this is not material that and, and there's not much time not much of a budget you're not going to sit down for this and write music like maestro john williams did two years earlier with star wars or or a year later after that with superman just not happening um so it's okay it's fine does what it's supposed to do but forget it. just forget it then we have the production designer, Paul Staheli. Remember that last name, Paul Staheli. Um, his IMDb lists him as active from 1974 to 20, 2006 with 28 production designer credits. His first gig was at Death's Door in 1979. The producer was Charles E. Sellier, Jr. He then did In Search of Historic Jesus, again, Charles E. Sellier, Jr. Uh, he did Hangar 18, and then he did... Um, uh, 119 episodes of the uh, late 2000s, early, late 1990s, early 2000s of Charmed. He also did 13 Perry Mason TV movies. This would have been from 1991 to 95, not the 1950s. They did some sort of revival Perry Mason movies in the 1990s. He did all 13 of those. He also has 24 art director credits, 20 of which, 20, one of those translates into 20 episodes of the Father Dowling Mysteries, and also 13, all 13 of those Perry Mason TV movies. That's kind of weird. Uh, you know, having a production designer and an art director credited, usually that means you have two different people because the real difference between those when they're same person doing it is that how they get credited and, and what that means in terms of their salary uh, and what it means in terms of the union. But He's credited for both. I don't know quite what was going on there, but uh, credited for both on all those uh, Perry Mason TV movies. And he's won no awards. Uh, the, the, you know, the design here. Like, again, when you get into production design, you're mostly talking about you know, sets and uh, things that go into that. His sets are fine. He does a reasonably good job of doing the interior of the space shuttle, understanding that most people didn't know what the interior of the shuttle looked like back then. Because again, it wouldn't go into space until a year later for the first one. So it doesn't really look like it that much. But he does a decent enough job of mimicking it. It's okay. It's okay. Um, you know, when you get into other sets, uh, the NASA, you know, flight control, it's okay. Um, he uses some stock footage in there, but he also built a decent chunk of the what would have been the rear of that. It's nowhere near as large, but you know, for a low budget film like this, it's okay. Um, similarly, when he's got things, you know, like laboratory stuff, okay, well, you can go a little further on that because laboratory stuff, okay, we can just pull this stuff out of storage and put it into a room and paint it white, and it looks like a lab. It's okay. Um, the interior of the alien spacecraft, eh. It's a lot of blinking lights and flashing screens and stuff like that. Um, it's dark, and but it's got a lot of very stereotypical computer stuff at that time. You know, where you see lots of blinking lights, and you know it's supposed to be important. Um, you know, watching it today, it looks really fake and stupid and hokey. Back then, not so much, but again, still at the time, low budget. And and he he, may, he does as well as he can with what he's got. Um, you know, you got a low budget, you do what you can. His six degrees of Star Trek is only William Shallert for this film. Special visual effects are very funny. They are by John Forrest Niss. Now his IMDb shows him as active from 1978 to present with 17 producer credits, most recently 10 on The Twilight Zone from the 19, 2019. He has 28 production manager credits, five editorial department credits, and one visual effects supervisor credit for this Hangar 18. It was his only a second gig. He was uh, prim first before that post-production supervisor for the Boogans in 1978. No idea what that is. I've never seen it or don't care. <laughs> but uh, this is the only time he ever did any special visual effects. Yeah. Well, if you've seen it, you know. The special visual effects, with one or two exceptions, are pretty uh, low budget. And again, this was coming on the heels of Star Wars in 1977. You know, everybody expected much more out of their science fiction by this time than we were getting here. So it was always a below budget film. The special effects were always low budget and nobody was gonna walk away impressed by this in any way, shape, manner, or form.
So I only did it once. <laughs> I don't know if that uh, necessarily tells you anything. It was a low-budget film. What do you do? Um, we can play Six Degrees of Star Trek with him, but again, it's only William Shallard. The costume designer is Julie Staheli. Remember that last name, the wife of the previously mentioned Staheli. She was with us from 1939 to 2018, died at the age of 78. Her IMDb shows her active from 1974 to 1990, with 11 costume designer credits and six costume and wardrobe department credits. And she won no awards. Her costumes here, a couple of different ways they come into play. I always say my regular viewers are going to get sick of me hearing and seeing me say it. But with my subs hovering around 200 and slowly climbing, I will be getting new viewers. So I always have to tell you that with costumes, a costume should always tell you something about the person who's wearing it. So if you saw me on the street today, for example, I'd be wearing my Emotions of Chuck Norris t-shirt, which is just the same picture of Chuck Norris about 15 times across the shirt with different emotions put in there. You know, Chuck Norris isn't exactly known for his range. Uh, and jeans, and that would tell you something about me as a person. Somebody else would make totally different choices in terms of what they wear. That will tell you something about it as a person. What I'm wearing here today is a costume. Nobody I have ever known or met anywhere in this, you know, the upper Great Plains of the United States wears this. This is a costume because I'm projecting a certain kind of image. So that's what this costume is telling you. And so with what we think of as kind of... Um, you know, regular, everyday wear costumes, stuff that's just practical. You know, these guys are wearing, the astronauts and stuff, wearing button-down shirts, slacks, things like that. Same thing with, you know, the, uh, air, the people who are in the uh, side of, of the people in the labs, they're all wearing that sort of thing. That tells us that they're not that high up on the food chain, um, but they wear stuff that's comfortable for that era and makes sense. And then we get... You know, lab coats and stuff like that. It's a little stereotypical, but, you know, that tells you, oh, they're lab guys. Uh, they did th stuff like the um, hazmat suits. That's perfectly reasonable. We, we'd we expect to see the almost the exact same thing today. Uh, we get into things like the sleazy politicians. They're wearing, you know, suits and ties and vests and all that. They look like they're upper crest, you know, a-holes, which is what they're supposed to be. Uh, we get the one guy in the Air Force uniform we see like every single time that you see someone in an Air Force uniform, with the sole exception of Stargate SG-1, the general has four stars. <laughs> Somehow in every single movie you get a four-star general. You know, you'd think maybe, maybe instead of a full general, how about a major general, lieutenant general, brigadier general? No, they always have four stars. You know, but it works. It's what it's supposed to be. Um, she did do one thing with costuming for a pressure suit that she saw. Oh, for like half a second in a jump scare. Um, and then the pressure suits that the astronauts were wearing. Pressure suits that they had in the astronauts were not particularly all that accurate, but given the budget that they had, as accurate as you're ever going to get. So not, not bad given what she had to work with. In terms of six degrees of Star Trek, this is only one person, William Shallard, for this film. The makeup designer, none, is listed, <laughs> which seems kind of impossible. Um, they do list some people in the makeup department. Uh, Carolee Bar uh, Bal's Bal Bal Balaz, sorry, sorry, Carolee, if you're still out there. Listed as a makeup artist. Um, Ken Horn is listed as makeup effects. Uh, Tim Nelson is a makeup artist for a second unit, and Peter T uh, Tupar is a hairstylist. I have no idea because you have to have a makeup uh, designer. Otherwise, you could not come up with this. Yeah, um, you know, our jump scare dummy or at best it's a human being with alien makeup. Somebody designed this. I don't know who. I would assume a makeup designer. Somebody came up with this, and if you don't look at it too hard, I mean, if you actually saw this in good makeup of somebody moving, this wouldn't be horrible. This wouldn't be horrible. Uh, used as it is as part of a jump scare and never seen again, uh, you know. Uh, you can see looking at it why they didn't spend that much time with the camera on it, but it's not bad. You know, if you were going to do that with better makeup, this would not be a bad design. I've seen way worse. So, uh, oops. So, um... 
with them, uh, the only way, so I, way I could find that we could play uh, did the, you know, six degrees of Star Trek is with William Shallert uh, again. So, uh, the reception on this. <clears throat> the um, the uh, reception on it. Well, the critics pretty much thought it sucked. <laughs> when the film was released, the New York Times film critic, uh, critic Vincent Canby totally dismissed it. And he wrote, Hangar 18 is the sort of melodrama that pretends to be skeptical, but requires that everyone watching it to be profoundly gullible. <laughs> it stars Robert Vaughn as the ruthless and fatally unimaginative White House Chief of Staff. The flying saucer itself looked like an oversized toy that might have been made in Taiwan. And again, coming off, you know, just a few years earlier, uh, with Star Wars viewers, we're expecting a lot more out of this, and so were any of the reviewers at the time. This is a low-budget film. No way around it. Low-budget, damn near cheap exploitation film. Except that they spent a lot of money on the stars and uh, the explosions and the chases. In terms of viewers, well, today, Rotten Tomatoes shows this sucker as having a 31%. I am, frankly, a little surprised that it's that high. Um, certainly no one who watched it at the time could possibly have been impressed by any of it. I may have seen it at the time. I don't remember. I don't remember at all. I went to about anything that was science fiction related at that time. I might have seen this in the theaters. I'm pretty sure I must have seen it on TV because it was released to TV so many times. I, I don't remember it. I didn't remember a thing about it until I watched it for review of this. Totally unmemorable. So at the ask, end of any episode, we ask ourselves, is it any good? Well, hmm. as I say, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. That's Frankenstein 1970. Um, it's really, really derivative of other types of films, um, all of which tend to have the producer, Charles E. Shelley's, uh, you know, fingerprints all over it. It did give some people uh, their start, particularly James L. Conway, the director, but as a movie, it's totally forgettable. You know, watch it with friends, watch, to laugh at it, watch it in the background while you're doing something else, but do not pay money to watch it. Watch it on YouTube. And again, that uh, Movie Central channel has a very good 720p copy. Link to it in my description box. Watch it there. And so that is all that I have to say about that. I'd love to keep the conversation going. So please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So a little bit of ad copy. I'm doing something a little bit different this Sunday for uh, Batwoman. So I'll do that, as always, poorly in the immortal words of Ernie Anderson, one of those voiceover guys that you always use to hear. <clears throat> this Sunday, March 15th, 2020, the Fandai Masters tried reviewing it. He's tried an uploaded reaction. Now he gives Batwoman one last-ditch attempt with a live stream reaction and watch party. Come watch Batwoman as it airs live on the CW with the Fandai Master. Watch him lose his mind in real time and contribute your own comments, questions, and nasty remarks, especially your nasty remarks. That's Sunday, March 15th, 2020, in North America at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain, and 5 p.m. Pacific. Don't miss the Fandai Master's live stream reaction and watch party for Batwoman. So, thank you for watching. That is all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from SYO Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one control and manipulation of minds.